and also one of Australia's leading women educationalists. You see by your program the scholastic career, uh, the, the degrees that are behind her. There are two MAs, the one from um, Cambridge, one from Melbourne, also DipEd, London. But this was merely a foundation, I suppose, upon which a career has been built. She has been principal of the Women's College at the University of Melbourne. She is most widely travelled, having travelled uh, on the continent and in Asia, and particularly in China. I mention all these things, the parents know this, but many of our younger folk may not have had time to know Miss Roper as long as Mum and Dad has known her. Mums and Dads will know, and so will many of our students, that she is very experienced on radio, on TV, in fact experienced in many, many fields. And we are most fortunate in having Miss Roper accepting to come to Rosebud tonight. Somebody made the remark to the headmaster only recently, how did you manage to get Miss Roper? Well, I don't know what the, the answer is, but the fact is that she's here. And as a matter of interest, and you're wondering why there are cameramen here, it's certainly not to get me, a film is being made of Miss Roper and her life, her activities. And Rosebud is honoured, perhaps, yes, honoured, to have uh, some small segment, we hope, in that film. They are going to record uh, some of her activities here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please give Miss Roper a really loud round of applause. an introduction like that, I just don't know how I'm going to live up to it. You know, a, a mighty build up to an almighty letdown. I hope not, but really your, your chairman was very generous indeed, and I would like to thank him and hope that you're not going to be disappointed. Uh, you know, it is a great help to have a chairman who gives the audience a little bit of an idea whether the speaker's going to be worth listening to or not and then it's up to the speaker to live up to what the chairman has said. I remember one chairman, uh, a good deal less expert than yours, who had to introduce a very well-known woman with the admittedly rather unfortunate name of Batty, Miss Batty. And uh, the nervous chairman, <laughs> to everyone's embarrassment, referred throughout his opening speech to Miss Dotty, which was uh, <laughs> no help. So I said, well, you want somebody who's really very well known. He said, no, you need, you know, it needn't be. No, he said, after all, Margaret Ollie wasn't very well known when no. Bell painted her. And then the famous Dobell court case over his oh, yes. Joshua Smith thing came through there. That was an Archibald entry, yes, wasn't it? Was. Legally, it's quite an interesting case because it's the only one where judges have tried to decide when it's a portrait, not a portrait. On September the 1st, 1939, and I got the berth on the ship, and I joined the ship at Liverpool, and was all set to go, but the ship was the Athenia. And of course, the ship got about 200 miles off the coast of Ireland, the war broke out, and the first shot of the war against Britain, at least, was the Athenia, it was torpedoed. So down the ship went, and I was rescued after 12, shall we say, mildly uncomfortable hours on a lifeboat. And um, the lifeboat was picked up by two ships. One was going on the city of Flint, which was later bombed by the Germans, it was going on to the United States, and the British Navy sent a destroyer, and we could go back home. And so there, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, I had to decide whether I'd go on to Canada or go back home, and I had no hesitation at all. I returned home. And of course, there I was for the duration of the war. has declared that there will be civil war if the Pakistan government arrests or harms him. He said President Yahya Khan's government had terrorized the people with guns after having arrested other pillars of his party. I congratulate you? Your speech was awfully good, but you shouldn't have been so shy. You should have made it, you know, a bit louder. I was born in one of the most literary villages in the world. I was born in the village of Howarth, and within about five minutes' walk of the famous Bronte Parsonage. And I used to go to the church built on the spot where the Reverend Patrick 
Bronte was rector and within sight of the famous rectory where his three daughters and his son uh, were writing this extraordinary Gondal saga that these children were writing. Later, of course, all of them, including the brother, wrote poetry and novels, and some of which, of course, are classics of world English literature. My great-grandparents used to go to the church and faintly, I had echoes from my grandmother, a faint remembrance of the Bronte sisters. They were rather disapproving ones. They were not quite the vicar's daughters, the rector's daughters that the good Yorkshire folk thought were right. You know, there was something a bit suspicious about rector's daughters who were novelists as well. But this was the atmosphere and uh, I was terribly sensitive to this and I used to walk along towards Wuthering Heights to Withens Farm, as it's called, and I used to go to Sunday school and think, well, you know, somewhere in this form sat the Bronte sisters and uh, this was really quite exciting and I wanted to follow in their footsteps poor thing, you know, I mean, my, my talent is incomparably out of this sort of range. And uh, uh, I think most of us imagine we're doing something reasonably sensible, I mean, uh, but are we? I mean, you know, we go to the right films and the right plays we can learn something from, we read the write papers and listen to the right news commentaries and I mean I never waste my time and this is what I think I, we ought to learn to just stop it and potter about and sit and think and walk and and uh, I very rarely read frivolous books anymore they just I'm not interested in them but I ought to be you see um, I think we should all know much more about stopping and loafing around and again I come back to the young the so-called hippies the best of them uh, They've got something, this opting out of the, of the rat race. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's very enviable. Well, I've got away at least from the nine to five, I've opted out of that. But I've bought into my own kind of rat race and the fact that I <laughs> enjoy most of it still makes it something of a, of, a, of a race. And I think I'm less useful as a person, less happy as a person because I don't stop and meditate. I've always been a verbalizer of any abilities that I have at all have been purely verbal because I've got very clumsy fingers. I can't sew very neatly, I can't draw, I can't type and I can't sing. <laughs> I'm not very musical. Uh, ever since I went on in a Sunday school concert in my native Yorkshire and, and recited some little poem, you know, I got the stage bug. <laughs> Two things happened. One is I started growing and getting taller and taller, you see, and, and, and a bit tall to play leading ladies. And in the school plays, I always used to have to play the hero. This was a, a bit of a liability. And then the other thing that happened, I started passing exams. Um, I'm about three months at the moment, of course, I'm only very small. When the hot pants first came out, I made a couple of pairs and I thought, well, right, I'll get into these and wear them. So I have, I've worn the hot pants and I've made myself... Some very few shows. women in public life in Australia, no women in, in the city council. One woman, I think, on the housing commission and I think she's off it. And so I've become a quite unashamed feminist. And incidentally, I get really quite angry with those women who do well and when they're interviewed say well of course I'm not a feminist well they should be feminists this doesn't mean they're any less feminine or attractive you know I suppose we all want to be a bit attractive it's a kind of treason of successful women to say they're not feminists they are feminine they're charm and feminine beauty of being absolutely you know essential things well they're wonderful if you can have them but they are played up a good deal and let's face it, the church, the Christian church, has really not done very well by us, you know. It's really, and I think one of the people to blame for this, certainly not Jesus Christ, who talked everything he had to say about women seemed to me pretty sensible and, uh, and wholly acceptable. But a great many of the churchmen who followed him, led unfortunately by St. Paul, whom I can't speak about with very much patience, 
Uh, we were to be kept in our places. We were a danger. Uh, women, wives be subservient to your husbands. And the whole attitude of the Pauline and followers was that women were a bit dangerous and you had to put up with them because they were necessary for certain functions in the world. But, as one cardinal put it in the medieval times, to you the woman may be human, but to us she is the serpent. I don't think they're terribly interested in women. They don't really want to be bothered talking to us. They're not interested in what we think. I don't think they're awfully interested in women as sex objects either beyond a certain normal physical need. And I think this is partly because they're afraid of women and they're all the image, the great tough frontier image, the football playing out back, dinky die, slack me on the back, mateship image is all part of an escape I mean, that they're rather scared of or a male-female relation that worries them and isn't easy for them and certainly isn't terribly enjoyable and they don't want to know what we think or what we feel and uh, I don't even think they're terribly interested in sex relations either. Very few Australian men who've always been in Australia can I think of as being you know stimulating companions or really interesting people thinking oh good I hope he rings me again you know this sort of thing Looking back, it's always been either, you know, foreigners living here or um, uh, Australians who've become pretty cosmopolitan. This may say something about me and not about them, but I really think it is that Australian men, on the whole, are not terribly interesting companions. <laughs> What looks like the beginning of the Third World War in Southeast Asia, the United States will regard Australia as a, as a massive aircraft carrier. In Anyone who is moderately left of centre is, is immediately get, runs into the problem of pinko or left wing label, which is death to some people. And again, what is regarded as dangerous leftism here in the UK would be just sort of a moderate official Labour Party Fabian Society policy. Someone like myself comes up against the difficulty of doing a job because a woman isn't given an opportunity to handle senior jobs except in exclusively feminine fields. If your political party or your political attitudes are regarded as not, you know, not entirely right-wing, LCP or safe, or if you're non-conformist in, in other ways, uh, then you've got this as a triple burden. Oh dear. Camera. In none of these ways am I extremist. I'm not an extremist feminist. I'm a keen one. I'm not an extremist political. I don't non-conform in any spectacular sort of way, but it does add up from the point of view of getting a senior responsibilities and so on in any sphere, academic, commercial, public life, political life. This adds up to certain liabilities that you carry. And yet, by the same token, Australia needs more, first of all, more women's experience and women's approach. It needs people who are prepared to be non-conformist, and heaven knows it needs people who are a little bit less politically conservative and left of centre than this country, which is, is one of the most conservative, I think, in the whole English-speaking world. April is Oral Hygiene Month, the month in which 3DB supports and reminds you of the importance of oral hygiene. A clean mouth is less accessible to dental trouble. Now, if you're unable to clean your teeth straight after eating, finish your meal with a cleansing food such as fruit. Crunch into an apple. I look so tired and weary. Boys are getting pushed into the tough, tough frontier image. Uh, and whether they want it or not, they've got to pretend very often to like a whole lot of tough, rather masculine, rough and tumble things, when really they're much more sensitive, they're much concerned with the things of the mind, with the arts perhaps, and rolling around in the mud of a football field. But this is what they feel perhaps uh, is, is, is the thing that is expected of them, or they become sissy. And this is again, I think, a special problem that Australian men, more than many, uh, have to imagine that they have to aspire to. We talk about a gentleman, a gentleman. And it uh, doesn't seem to me entirely coincidental that the long hair is now so popular. 
uh, this seems to me a deliberate assertion of the boys to be what they want to be. If they want to wear fancy clothes and beads and have long hair, why not? As long as they're clean, I must say I'm not very enthusiastic about grubby long hair or grubby beads. But if they want to be this, and if they don't want to take part in a whole lot of rough and tumble things, if they wish to be more sensitive and more feminine, this doesn't mean that they're less attractive or less, or less male. They're just being really rather different from some of the stereotypes. And the long hair and the style of dress may be a symbol of this kind of thing. And if they wish to have some, adopt some of the more feminine qualities, well, that I think is, is, is something of a relief and something of, a, of an asset. And uh, broad beans are down tonight, five or ten cents a pound, very nice young beans. Yeah, well, they're a bit of a change, aren't they, yeah. the broad beans? Also on the way around to the butcher's girls, and I noticed some people people. people to visit, as long as you haven't to do anything very elaborate, you know, I don't feel that to have to spend a whole day, you know, ice making pavlovas and icing cakes, by my definition, isn't just worth the time spent on it, but if you can have lots of people in and just have plenty of food, but fairly simple, then I think this is, this is one of the real joys of life, and having them in your own home rather than in a restaurant or cafe. I suppose uh, this is partly one compensates for lack of a family. Um, any woman who doesn't marry is the poorer. Uh, it's obviously a terribly important uh, experience. Even if it doesn't work out awfully well, it's a very important experience, to put it mildly, that one should have. You know, if you ask any girl between, I suppose, 15 and 20, she would assume that she was going to marry. Um, someone said to me, no girl ever really thinks she won't marry. Well, it never entered my mind that I wouldn't marry. I mean, I'd always taken it for granted. I wanted to go to college, I wanted to do things, but everybody married and I was going to marry and this was the, this was the pattern. And um, I've always had quite a lot of men friends. I'm never short of male company. I've had probably rather more than average, rather less than average. Uh, and yet it just didn't work out that way. <laughs> what a question. Um, well, it's very, you know, it, it's hard to begin to tell you because you've got to throw away almost everything you've read about China in our mass media. Um, it's it's not an ex a, a press, I mean, I don't imagine they've got all the freedom. What I, I'm really not sure whether to have had a marriage that's failed is worse than having no marriage at all. I thought that, I mean, unless I could marry with a very good chance of making a success of it, I preferred not to. Now, I don't know whether this, that it wouldn't have been better for me to have married knowing that it was not going to be exactly what I wanted, because I think it would have made a valuable experience. I'd have developed through it. You're on talk back in action nine in a moment. We'll be talking to my Roper. Well, I've just about to become a foster parent. Australian unemployment figures for March are the highest since 1968. Children don't get sold into factories or brothels anymore. In China, they don't die on the streets as they did. And in the streets of Shanghai, where a couple of thousand dead bodies were picked up every year from the streets. This doesn't happen anymore, and I think this is, uh, to put it mildly, an achievement. The international magazine Newsweek has predicted that the White House is ready to approve the sale of American-built civilian jet liners to communist China. I don't think they enjoy the same measure of freedom that we do. The sit-in protest by anti-conscription demonstrators is continuing at the Department of Labor and National Service. Dr. Jim Cairns and three other demonstrators were able to get into the main office, but all other demonstrators and pressmen were kept outside. I don't think Australia's trouble is so much that we've got a bad China policy as if we've got no China policy, really. They feel they're ready once again, as they once did centuries ago, to play a very crucial part in the world situation. The Chinese leader, Mao Zedong, is reported to have sent a personal message of support to Pakistani leader Yahya Khan. You couldn't even say that China had a foreign policy, surely? Oh, yes, you can. Foster Dulles met Zhou Enlai at an international conference, and Zhou Enlai held out his hand to shake hands, and Foster Dulles pointedly turned away. But it's more than rude. It was absolutely significant, as an example, to say who has been isolating whom. For heaven's sake, let's get past all these labels, you know, political and religious and so on. By by the way, Gerald, may I just conclude by saying that I've got an enormous fig tree in my back garden with stacks of figs, and if you would like to call, I can 
<laughs> supply well, you thank with you. Quantity. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> anyway, the thank you. The king was, was, was no good for Van Gogh, mm. you see. Mm. But Burchard, of all people, being attacked yes. as, as an yeah. anti-communist. And uh, he got this copy of the Vanguard in Peking immediately. Oh, it's interesting that, in a way, one's life does become, in some sense, what you make it that it can't be exactly as you see it, but if you've got a certain determination, a certain sense of where you want to go, in an odd sort of way, very often it's just where you get, if you've got a reasonable sense of moving towards your destination. I don't mean it ruthlessly, because I don't think I've done it ruthlessly, but these are the things I've always wanted to do, and looking back now, in a way, I've done them, but not anything like the way that I once thought I would, and I've not done any of them well. Not brilliantly well, anyway. I've done them competently, perhaps a bit better than average. Can you do anything really superlatively well unless you're absolutely determined that this is the one thing you're going to do and you're prepared to sacrifice a whole lot of things and concentrate on it? I doubt if you can. And in a way, if you're going to spread your butter such as it is fairly over a number of things, it's rather more thinly spread and that for real excellent quality in anything, you've got to be prepared to make a lot of sacrifices and concentrate. And this is something that I haven't done. So many of the things that we were used to, the church, the uh, army, the school, the communist party, the strong uh, groups that had all these rules and these decisions that you could certainly depend on, most of them have disappeared. It's very much harder for you in the world that is changing, changing so frighteningly fast. And amongst other things that are changing is this whole business of the way women have got to develop and their relations with, with the opposite sex in a, whole, in a whole lot of ways. It's a difficult and a very great problem, a very great problem. The whole of the permissive society, it's infinitely more difficult, I think, to live in a permissive society than in a rather more rigid puritanical society. Neither of them is very easy, but I think that each of them is very difficult, and somehow they're going to have to, have to come together again. But I think if we then can start to think boys of girls and girls thinking about boys as people, as individuals, each with their own special quality, but think of them as human beings. You can't entirely get rid of stereotypes. One doesn't want to. One wants a great many differences in this exciting business of sex relationships, but not in the questions of stereotypes, particularly stereotypes that put us women a little bit lower than the men, any more than we want to be a bit higher. We are people, we are individuals. Let's be ourselves. Let's develop our feminine qualities, our strength and our character as human beings in the world, as individuals, in a world which needs us. Which so perhaps us most of us are better off spreading ourselves a bit than trying to do well in a thing that we just haven't got the ability for. I think this is certainly true of me. All of us who have this wish have always had this nagging sense of disappointment that, oh, damn it, is this really worth doing? It's a pretty mediocre kind of thing. Uh, you know, one is always haunted by a concept of some, something that you could be doing so much better and that you know, at least speaking for myself, you're never really going to do any better than this particular thing. And though it's moderately good and people are pleased in a way and you're happy to do it, you're always haunted by this concept of excellence that you're never going to achieve. I'll keep on at my 50, 55 or 60 percent on two or three fields quite moderately and be reasonably happy over that, but one always has a, a, a feeling of, of disappointment that you haven't done something for once, you know, really and truly well. Just as, as we all have the feeling that we regret not having made ourselves into really good people, that one is aware all the time of little shoddinesses and failings in oneself as a person. Uh, though you grieve over them less as you get older. I mean, this is one of the consolations of you accept your own failings and your own inadequacies and your own little shoddinesses, not willingly, but with a little less uh, heart burning than you accepted your faults when you were young. The, the only thing uh, that I do find difficult to accept, and I wish I could accept it, is having less time, growing older and having less time to do things uh, that you know, once you would say, oh, well, in a few years, I'll do that or I'll go there. 
Now, I can't say this anymore because there aren't going to be all that number of years when I'm going to be, you know, well and strong and bouncing about. You know, I'm late 50s now. You know, I sometimes think I should have written up in my study, at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. And there's just so many things that, you know, one wants to do and, and fit in, because I still feel that there's a tremendous challenge in the things I still want to do and see.